you again for this opportunity tonight that we have to come and praise and worship you, God. Help us to enjoy uh, being in your presence. Lord, your, your word says that you will show us the paths of life in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Lord, we want to live in that tonight, God. We want to live in the joy of your presence. And so, God, just inhabit the praises of your people tonight. God, help us to put everything else aside and just focus on you. And God, let us hear what you want to speak to us through the word tonight. Let us leave change because of what you would do by your Holy Spirit. We'll give you praise. We'll give you glory for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
he's still King of Kings, Lord of Lords, though Satan rages, amen, we will not be defeated because he's in control. Jesus is in control. Praise the Lord. Come.
praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we just want you to look upon us, Lord, and be pleased with our lives tonight. Hallelujah. Be blessed, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We worship you, Lord.
He's worthy. He's more than enough. He's the all-sufficient one tonight. Jesus, hallelujah, we worship you tonight. We thank you, God, that you show up when we praise you from our hearts tonight. And God, we can sense your presence in this room. And God, thank you that you are the all-sufficient one. You're more than enough to meet our needs if we'll look to you in faith tonight. God, you can make a way where there seems to be no way. And Lord, we just put our confidence, we put our trust, we put our faith completely in you, Jesus, tonight. And Lord, we just pray that you'll once again prove your faithfulness. One of the situations that are weighing heavy upon our hearts tonight. God, move in a mighty way in this time of Bible study and preaching of your word. God, I pray that our hearts will be open to what you want to say to us tonight. Let there be a hundredfold harvest in each heart, God, as we respond to your word, as your spirit would direct us tonight. We just thank you, we praise you, we give you the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. So we started a series uh, a couple weeks back, similar to our series that we did on the book of Galatians about two years ago, and we're calling this series Go Deeper. We're looking at Jonah, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, verse by verse, and uh, looking at some of the things that God wants to teach us from His Word. And the greatest theme, I think, from the book of Jonah, as we discussed when we started this study, is the call of God upon a person's life. And we can see uh, Jonah is unique, as we said in the first, uh, first night that we started the book of Jonah, the background and the themes of the book of Jonah. Jonah is one of the only prophets in the Bible where we don't really know much about what he prophesied, except to Nineveh, which is and it's really just a very short message, repent, right? But other than that, we, we learn more from the book of Jonah by observing Jonah's life. And we can learn a lot from his mistakes, and the idea is that we don't repeat them, amen? And uh, God has a call upon our lives, whether it's a call to full-time ministry like Jonah, or whether it's just a call to serve and follow him as Jesus' disciple. And our response to God's call upon our life, regardless of how involved that call might be, uh, is, is important. It's important that we respond to God appropriately, that we don't run from the presence of the Lord like Jonah did or uh, rebel against what God wants us to do, but that we say, God, I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. Amen. That we be clay in the potter's hand that he can shape and mold and form and use. Our heart's desire ought to be to be a vessel of honor. Amen. Fit for the master's use. And however he sees fit, uh, he can use us. And so we've been looking at that in the book of Jonah and we'll observe a lot from Jonah's life. Uh, on uh, what are some good responses and what are some bad responses. And that's just life, isn't it? There's some people that come into our life and they're abrasive and they're like sandpaper people and we're like, God, why does this person have to be in my life? Well, some people you learn that's how I'll never be. Amen? And that's the lesson. It's not that you want to be like them. It's that you remember how awful, how abrasive, how much of a sandpaper person that person was to you, and sometimes it's to refine us and to change us, right? And it's a difficult person because there's things in our life that we don't want to change, but sometimes it's just, uh, we're not going to be like that person, and we'll always remember how obnoxious, how, how awful that person was, and hopefully it will keep us from being the same way, amen? And so we can learn from both the good and the bad in Jonah's life example in the book of Jonah, and that's God's intention. Aren't you thankful that the Bible is not just uh, glossed over with uh, all good people who never had any problems? Uh, he, he lets us see into the life of some people. You look at King David who struggled obviously with sin, yet God called him a man after God's own heart. We see both the good and the bad. And that, that's what it is to be a Christian in 2018, isn't it? We're going to have some struggles. We're not perfect. But thankfully, the grace of God helps us. The Holy Spirit helps us. When we fall down, that we don't stay down, and then we get back up. We let the Holy Spirit help us uh, run the race that Jesus has set before us with perseverance and run to the finish line. And uh, in the end, we can see Jonah, he got back up. It was rough, but he got back up. And I think there's some life lessons that we can learn that will help us in our walk with God in this teaching. So we're going to continue uh, with the rest of chapter 1 tonight uh, that we didn't cover last week. 
But last week we covered verses 1 through 3. And remember we dealt with the word of the Lord to Jonah. And that's uh, the very beginning of the chapter. The word of the Lord. We discussed the manner in which God speaks to his people. Do you remember that? What are some ways that God speaks to us that are true in Jonah's day but that are still true today in 2018? Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> What's the main way that God speaks to us? His word, right? His word. What are some other ways, though, that we see in the Bible and that Jonah and some of these other men of God heard God's voice? Dreams, yeah. Dreams are things where God speaks to us most of the time when we're asleep, right? What's, what, what is a similar thing when we're awake? Visions, right? God gives us a vision. Sometimes he gives us a vision we're awake. But we see something as if it's right there. And God speaks to us in that way. He speaks to us through other people. Aren't you thankful for the fivefold ministry? The pastors, evangelists, preachers, evangelists, missionaries, the people that God used, prophets. And God still uses people like that today. And we talked about also uh, last week how after the day of Pentecost, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was poured out, God can now speak to us in New Testament times through what? Tongues interpretation, right? The gifts of the Spirit. It could be prophecy in our own language, or it could be tongues and interpretation. And uh, that's something they didn't have under the Old Covenant. But when Jesus took our sins away, it made a way for the Holy Spirit to not just be with us, amen, but His the Holy Spirit can be on the inside of us. And that's what Holy Spirit baptism is all about, is having the Holy Spirit overflowing from the inside of us, an overflow of God's power and presence. And that's God's desire for every believer to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And He speaks to us in that way. He can speak to us individually. He can speak to the whole church through the gifts of the Spirit. But we should not take for granted that God, the Word of the Lord, oftentimes comes to us through the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit. We took a look at Jonah's response last week in verses 1 through 3, his response to the word of the Lord, how important it is that we respond correctly, right? How should we respond to the word of the Lord every day? Anytime God speaks to us, we ought to respond to him in simple faith, right? God, I believe your word. I believe it's for me. And God, I want to just have simple obedience to your word. If you have simple faith, what should naturally follow is simple obedience. It's not what followed in Jonah's life, right? He heard the word of the Lord, but he decided, I'm going to do the exact opposite. I'm going to go in the other direction, and that never turns out well. We need to have simple faith. We need to have simple obedience anytime God speaks to us. And that's when we can grow, we can mature, we can go deeper in our walk with God and uh, become more the people that He wants us to be. God is still telling His people in 2018, as we talked about last week, what? Arise and sit on your pew. No, that's not what He said, right? He told Jonah, arise and go. He's telling us in Colorado Springs, Finished Work Worship Center, yes, it's great, thankful for our building, for these lovely chairs, and everything God's provided for us, but He's telling us, arise and go. There's a harvest field and we're going to have to meet people where they're at. The Ninevites weren't going to come running to the Jewish temple and say, what must we do to have a covenant relationship with God? Any more than today in 2018, people are running to the church building anymore saying, what must I do to be saved? We're going to have to meet them right where they're at and tell them that Jesus loves them, that he wants to save them, that he can make a difference in their life. And so where are we supposed to go? We talked about it last week. If you're a fisherman and you want to catch fish, you go where the fish are. And Jesus said, I'll make you what? Fishers of men. Well, you have to go where the men are that are lost. Amen? You've got to go where the lost are. That doesn't mean we participate in their sin, but it means we do have to come out of our Christian bubble and go into the world and tell people. The book of Jude says we have to rescue some as if we're pulling them straight out of the fires of hell. That may mean that God sends us to a bar. You better make sure God sent you, though. God sends us to a place in town that we wouldn't normally, as a Christian, you know what I'm saying, gather at. But there's some lost people that need Jesus, and we need to arise and go. And that's what he was telling Jonah. Jonah had plenty of excuses of why the Ninevites didn't need him to come and tell them about uh, their need to repent. And we can think of a lot of excuses as well. But in the meantime, hell is being split wide open. 
with lost people that need to hear what we already know. And so we need to remember that from uh, what we looked at in verses 1 through 3. Then we looked at verses 4 through 10, the next paragraph. And we looked at uh, that, that paragraph dealt with God sending a storm to warn Jonah. And we learned that God uses the storms of life even for us, doesn't he? He uses adversity, he uses difficulty sometimes to get us back on track. He's not trying to kill us, right? He's just trying to nudge us in the right direction. And he could have killed Jonah if he wanted to, but he wasn't interested in killing him or punishing him necessarily. He wanted Jonah to get back on track. And sometimes God uses the storms of life and adversity and difficulties to point us back in the right direction. We talked about how when a believer is obeying the voice of the Lord, they can be a tremendous blessing to others around them. That's God's desire, isn't it? That people look at our lives and they don't just hear the words that we say, but they see our lifestyle example and see that it's consistent with the words that we say. And they say, there's something real about this person who believes in Jesus. Maybe I need to learn about their God. Maybe I need to learn about their Jesus. God wants us to be a tremendous blessing and a help. We ought to be the best employees on our job as Christians, amen? We ought to be the best citizens in our city, in our nation as Christians. We shouldn't be a poor example. We should be the best example of what a human being ought to be because we're filled with the, the power of the Holy Spirit. We're filled with faith in Jesus. And so we, we should be a tremendous blessing. But when a believer is stubborn, we talked about this last week, as Jonah was, when we're rebellious, resisting the voice of the Lord, that same believer, instead of being a tremendous blessing, can end up being a tremendous curse upon those around them, a hindrance to the lost uh, around them. And Jonah was. He's here in this boat, and these sailors, these mariners, are going, somebody's got something going on that's wrong in their life, because this isn't an ordinary storm. And so instead of being an incredible blessing and pointing these sailors to Jesus, who worshipped all kinds of gods, you can tell by their reaction when the storm came, instead Jonah became a curse, and, and he became a hindrance to these mariners, these sailors, getting saved. We saw from these verses, verses 4 through 10, that now is not a time for the church to be fast asleep. Remember, Jonah is asleep in the bottom of the boat, and here these ungodly pagan fishermen, they're cutting themselves, they're making incantations, they're praying to their gods, doing everything they can to see if they can get this storm to stop, and Jonah is asleep. And that's kind of a picture of the modern church. Instead of us being a help and bringing people the answer of Jesus and the cross and what the Holy Spirit can do in a person's life, too many of us are fast asleep in our comfort zone instead of being where God wants us to be. We should have 1 Peter 3.15, uh, as a guide for our lives, being ready always to give an answer of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear, because we were once lost. And we know Jesus had to reach down and rescue us. There's people all around us that need to know about that same hope in Jesus. Amen? And so we need to re respond appropriately to the voice of the Lord, be living a consistent example to those around us so that we can be a tremendous blessing. And people can look at our lives and they can be turned to Jesus Christ. They can understand who Jesus is because they see him in our lives. They can understand what Jesus did at the cross because they hear us talking about it and applying our faith to his finished work. And so we need to remember that. Look at this now real quick and we'll, uh, we'll move into the uh, PowerPoint tonight. But you can remember uh, Jonah is called from this area here and he's called to go to Nineveh. God tells him, and that's a great distance from where Jonah is living, and instead he decides to go to Tarshish, and goes in the opposite direction, and uh, not a good thing to run from the presence of the Lord, and to go in the opposite direction. He ends up in the belly of a great fish, as we're going to find out tonight, and it's not just a fable or a mythological story, it's really what happened, and there's a lot of people who try and explain it away as it just being a moral lesson, but this really happened. And uh, I think we'll get to heaven one day and we'll have Jonah verify, oh yeah, this really happened. <laughs> and uh, we ought to learn from the lessons uh, of Jonah going in the total opposite direction of where God wanted him to go and what resulted from that. Tonight we're going to finish up chapter 1 and uh, look at the last two paragraphs and we're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us uh, some more life lessons like we saw in those first two paragraphs 
And our, our hope, our desire is that we can mature in our faith. Amen? That we can uh, grow in our relationship with the Lord. So let's read chapter 1. And I want us to make sure that we have it in context. And then we're going to get into those last two paragraphs tonight. Let's start with uh, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city. Cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Verse 5, Then the mariners were afraid, and cried, Every man unto his God, cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon your God. If so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellow, Come and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and a lot fell upon Jonah. It's kind of similar to us drawing straws today. Somebody comes up with a short straw. We're like, oh, you're the one. And that's what happened to Jonah. Verse 8, Then they said unto him, Tell us, we pray you, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation, and from where do you come? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto you, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. Verse 12, And he said unto them, Take me up, and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you, for I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not. For the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech you, O Lord, we beseech you, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not upon us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. Verse 15, So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord, and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Probably not a very pleasant place to be. It's in the belly of a great fish, the belly of a whale, as the story goes. But we want to look at verses uh, 11 through the end of the chapter. It's actually two different paragraphs. The first paragraph, we can see the mariners or the sailors look for a remedy from Jonah. And that's in verses 11 through 14. The mariners are looking for a remedy to this horrible situation from Jonah. And uh, in their desperation, they ask Jonah, how can we appease or how can we find peace with your God? Because again, they did what they know to do, which in that part of the world, casting lots, they did it at Jesus' crucifixion, remember, for his garments, the Roman soldiers, a very common practice. It would be like drawing straws where you put straws in your hand. Kids probably don't even know what that is. But you put straws in your hand. They're all different lengths. And whoever gets the shortest straw is the loser, basically. And then there's some superstition in that, in, in casting lots. But they, they believe that whoever got the short end of the stick, so to speak, was the one that there was a problem with. And Jonah comes up with it. And they're like, okay, what do we have to do? to appease your God, to find peace with your God. You're obviously the problem. And they're looking for a, rem a remedy. You know, what an open door for Jonah to preach under normal circumstances, right? What an opportunity. I mean, how many times do we have it where people say, well, what's the answer for peace in my storm? You know, it's rare that somebody flat out just asks us that way. Are we ready to tell about Jesus if it does happen? If someone does ask us that, that uh, uh, blatantly, that uh, openly. But Jonah is not ready to preach. He's not ready to proclaim the truth. Why? Because he's running from the presence of the Lord. And instead of a prophet, you think, would be ready always to give an answer. Well, he wasn't ready to give an answer. He knew the answer. 
that he's still running from the presence of the Lord. He's not responding to the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, as he ought to. And so he's blowing a huge opportunity to point these men to his God. And we need to recognize there's a lot of opportunities around us and that we shouldn't miss those opportunities. We need to ask the Holy Spirit every day, help me to be ready to testify, to witness, to point people to Jesus. You know, the world all around us in 2018 and their desperation, they're going to be asking believers in Jesus, how can we appease or find peace with your God? There's going to be some people who look at our life if we're living a consistent Christian example and they're going to say, how do you do it? They're going to say, how, how do you have difficulties in your life but yet you don't lose it? You don't go drink at the bar. You don't uh, shoot up drugs. You're not doing what everybody else is. How are you holding it all together, right? And we need to be ready to give them an answer. How can we appease or find peace with your God? Are we prepared to point them to the only remedy? To Jesus Christ and Him crucified, we ought to be, because He is the only remedy for the sin sick soul. And we've got to point people to Jesus. Peace with God is only found through the blood of Christ's cross and by reconciling all things to Himself because of His finished work. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 19 and 20, first part of verse 20. Colossians chapter 1. Starting with verse 19, it says this, For it pleased the Father that in Him, in Jesus, should all fullness dwell. He's fully God. That's what He's saying. And having made peace through the blood of His cross by Himself to reconcile all things to Himself. How can we find peace with God? It's only through Jesus. Amen? That's what that verse is saying, isn't it? It pleased the Father that in Him, the fullness of the Godhead, is in Jesus. He is fully God, but He's fully man. And it's because of the blood of His cross, His own blood that was spilled out at Calvary, that we can find peace with God. God doesn't hold our past against us if we just express faith in His Son, Jesus, and His sacrifice. And we say, yes, I want Jesus to be the master over everything in my life. We can be reconciled. You know, probably the easiest uh, way to understand that word well, probably two ways. Uh, when we do our checkbook, most people don't even do it anymore because it's, the computer does it for you. But you used to have to write down all your outstanding checks and what your bank balance was and find out that if what the bank said you had in the bank matches what you have in your checkbook. You reconcile your checkbook, right? You make sure that what's going out matches what the bank says is going out, that what was coming in and deposits matches what deposits are going in. You reconcile. You make, there has to be a harmony, right, between your checkbook register and the bank statement. And reconciliation for God is us being brought back into harmony with God. Though our sins were as scarlet, Isaiah 1, they can be made white as snow. And that's the work that Jesus did, a work of reconciliation. So how can we have peace with God? How can we appease the God who is angry because of sin? When people ask us that in 2018, we need to point them to Jesus and the cross. Amen? That's what the Bible tells us is the only remedy. The truth is, there is victory in the cross, and there is victory only in the cross of Christ. Also, the truth is, the only thing standing between mankind and eternal hell is the cross of Christ. Amen? It's not religion. It's not denominationalism. It's Jesus and the cross is the only keeping, the only thing keeping people from uh, splitting hell wide open. And so we need to be ready to tell people about Jesus and His finished work. It's quite possible that the mariners just wanted out of a bad situation, right? That they were in. They weren't really that interested in fully committing to Jonah's God, but it was an opportunity for Jonah to proclaim God's truth nonetheless. And sometimes we make excuses. Oh, well, I'm not going to go talk to that person on my job because they're such a heathen. They're not going to care what I have to say. Well, leave that up to the Lord. Amen? Leave that up to God. Sometimes we have no idea how close to repentance someone might really be if we'll just tell them the truth. Some people are so bound up in lies, if we would just tell them the truth, they might have something different to think about. And they would change the way that they look at life. And so Jonah misses the opportunity you know, there may be lost people that we come across and they only want us to pray for them or they only come to church once or twice 
because they just want out of their bad situation. And they're trying to use God like the genie in the bottle, right? They'll go to church a couple times. They'll ask you to pray for them, but they're not really making the commitment to the Lord. But they just want out of a bad circumstance. You know what? We should never neglect the opportunity to preach the gospel to them. Amen? Don't give them a Christian cliche. Give them the gospel. Tell them what the Holy Spirit tells you to say to them. And then even if they are just trying to get out of a bad situation, they're only going to have you pray until the bad situation goes away. They're only going to come to church a couple of times until everything is fixed. That's fine. If that's, that's between them and God. But if you give them the Word of God, and you give them what the Spirit of God told you to say to them, and, and that opportunity that you have when they're laying on their bed at night, the Christian cliche won't be in their head. That'll just make them mad most of the time. But the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, will begin to draw on that. Amen? He draws upon that, and He confirms the, the Bible, the Gospel that we preach to them. And so we don't want to miss any of the opportunities that God brings our way. As Jonah missed a huge opportunity here to be a consistent example for the Lord. Jonah continues to flee from the call of God. We can see in verses 11 through 14. It almost seems he was apathetic and willing to be thrown overboard, maybe even suicidal. Well, just throw me into the sea if that's what it takes. Right? Isn't that kind of the attitude that kind of comes across in verses 11 through 14? And he has that attitude rather than repenting and, and for, uh, repenting from how he responded to the voice of the Lord and running from the call of God. What do you think God would have done if Jonah would have repented? I don't think he would have had to have been swallowed by a great fish. Amen. I believe the storm would have stopped right there and he still could have been a witness to those men, but God would have told him what? Now you need to go to Nineveh. And he didn't want to hear that. And we're the same way. We don't always want to uh, do what God tells us to do because it's inconvenient to our flesh, to what we want to do. But we need to say like Jesus did in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And no matter how painful that might be at times. When conscience is awakened and a storm raised, nothing will turn it into a calm but parting with the sin that occasioned the disturbance. That's powerful. When you're in a storm of life, all, all Jonah had to do was just repent. He didn't have to get all, uh, you know, woe is me and say, well, just throw me into the sea because I'm the idiot, I'm the stupid one. He could have just repented to his God and said, God, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. I've been a bad example for even these men who don't even know me. And I want your forgiveness. And God would have calmed that storm. I believe it. I believe he would have. But if, if God raises a storm in our life, the only thing that's going to calm it is when we part with the sin that gave the devil a foothold in the first place. Amen? And so we better uh, take those words to heart tonight. By trying to save Jonah's life, the pagan sailor showed more compassion than Jonah did. Because Jonah did not want to warn the Ninevites of the coming judgment of God. Believers should be ashamed when unbelievers show more concern and compassion than they do. God wants us to be concerned for all of His people, lost and saved. Amen? Here are these sailors. They did everything they could. Even after they talked with Jonah and he said, throw me overboard, they, did it. they threw everything off, made the boat as light as they could. They rowed as hard as they could to get the boat to shore, but they realized this storm wasn't an ordinary storm. And they weren't going to be able to save Jonah from what was going on there. And that they showed more compassion and concern than a lot of Christians do for lost people. And that ought to convict us. Colorado Springs, the Pikes Peak region, is not going to care what the people of Finished Work Worship Center know until they know that the people of Finished Work Worship Center care. Amen? They're not going to care what we know. We're not going to be able to expound Scripture to them until they know that we care. And sometimes it's just in the practical things of life, serving somebody. Yes, praying for them, but sometimes even getting our hands dirty. Amen? And helping them in a practical way that they see that we really do care. The body of Christ really does care. The church doesn't just want my money. They want to really help. And we need to be that kind of church in Colorado Springs so that then we can tell them the truth. We can tell them what we know. Amen? But we need to show people that we care if they're going to care about what we know. We should be moved with compassion to share the message of the cross through whatever means God makes available to our community. Amen? Our community.
community needs Jesus. Our community needs the message of the cross. But they don't need it for head knowledge's sake. They need it to affect their heart. And the best way that's going to happen is by us living a loving Christian life to even the lost people who don't deserve it. We didn't deserve the love and compassion of Jesus when he reached down and saved us. And so we need to reach out even to unsaved people and show them the love of God. Number two, this last paragraph, chapter one, it's in verses 15 through 17. We can see this. Jonah gets thrown out into the stormy sea. What resulted? As soon as Jonah was thrown out into the sea, he was right. It didn't have to be that way, but he was right. As soon as he was thrown out into the sea, what happened? The sea stopped its raging, right? The storm went calm. And didn't that get the attention of the sailors? I mean, they had worshipped pagan gods. They had seen witchcraft and demonic stuff that does have a power in it. But when they threw Jonah into the sea, and the sea went, Phew! and I believe that's what happened. I believe it went calm, just like that. I bet those sailors were shaking in their boots, don't you? Well, what in the world just happened? And God was speaking to them in spite of Jonah's disobedience, in spite of his rebellion. Those men knew something supernatural just happened. And isn't that the grace of God that even in our disobedience sometimes, people can see the hand of God upon our lives? And that was the grace of God in Jonah's life. We must drown that which otherwise will drown us. The throwing of Jonah into the sea immediately put an end to the storm. If we turn from our sins, God will soon turn from his anger. Amen. That's all really Jonah had to do was turn from his sins. And he thought if he punished himself, if he got thrown overboard, that that would make it better. The story wasn't over for Jonah. It had just begun. He's about to get swallowed by a great fish. But it, the, the storm was over for the sailors. And so what a picture we see there. If we want the storms of life, a lot of times they're self-inflicted, aren't they? We've, we've disobeyed God and we should not be in, in wonder or amazement that we're in the problems that we're in because we're living in sin. Or we've let sin into our lives, even as believers sometimes. But if we'll get rid of the sin... God can turn from his anger. He put his anger upon Jesus on the cross so that we don't have to have it hanging over our heads. We can have the peace of God in our everyday walk uh, with the Lord. What resulted after the calming of the sea? The mariners feared the Lord exceedingly, it says. That's kind of probably the, one of the biggest understatements, right? I mean, they were probably going, well, what in the world? This, this, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Maybe repentance, many scholars argue on these verses 15 through 17, some say they actually got saved. In fact, Brother Swagger leans towards that, that they got saved because they offered sacrifice. Other scholars say, well, they offered sacrifices to a lot of gods, so maybe they were just... But either way, God got these men, uh, got their attention through the supernatural act, and uh, if they got saved, amazing that God uh, could take... Jonah's disobedience and still use it, turn it around to get a hold of ungodly people. Maybe repentance in the way uh, that God views it. Some scholars argue that these men didn't really exhibit true repentance, but they at least, regardless of what position you take on uh, the, the, what happened with the mariners, at least they have reverence and respect for Jonah's God. It's obvious in the text. And they offered sacrifices and made vows to God. And I think that's uh, something that if, if people in our community today would do that, that are lost. Reverence and respect the God that we serve, Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the Jesus who went to the cross. Uh, I think our country, our community would be a whole lot better place, don't you? And that's what we need to see happen. God is able to use even our mistakes to help others come to know Him. And that's just simply His amazing grace, isn't it? has nothing to do with us. We're foolish. We do foolish things. But God sometimes even takes our foolish rebellion and resistance to His Word and His voice, and He can turn it around for good. Romans 8, 28, most of us could quote this verse. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. God has a way of turning things around even though we didn't know he was going to do that. Jonah had no idea. The Lord prepares a great fish to swallow Jonah. 
We see in verses 15 through 17, how often does our sovereign God orchestrate circumstances and events in our lives that may seem harsh or uncomfortable at first, but that are for our good in the end. Think about it if Jonah had been left out in the open, in the open sea. God, it said, prepared a great fish, obviously big enough to swallow Jonah whole and keep him alive because he's in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights. Can you imagine how nasty that smells in the belly of a fish and what they eat? You know, you go down to the beach and you see, you know, jellyfish or fish on the beach. It's not a pleasant smell. Jonah is in an unpleasant, uncomfortable place. But God prepared it. He orchestrated that fish to be just the right place at just the right time because Jonah could have drowned and died. He could have been eaten by a predator, right? But God prepared, it said, a great fish to swallow Jonah. And sometimes God does that for us. He uses harsh or uncomfortable situations in our life to preserve our life or to bring out what's good for us in the end. We may not thank Him for it when it first happens, but as we look back, we've got to say, God, I recognize now that was for my good. And I'm thankful for, for your uh, hand of providence upon my life. Now, the Lord had prepared a great fish does not mean that the fish was created then and there, but that the Lord ordered it to be at a certain place and at a certain time in order to swallow Jonah. And think about that. Only God could do that. Only God could do that. Jonah getting swallowed by this great fish Really was Jonah's one last chance, wasn't it? One last chance to repent of running from the presence of the Lord. One last chance to submit to and obey the voice of the Lord that God had called him to arise and go to Nineveh. One last chance. This, this fish could have digested Jonah, right? Let's just be real. Could have digested Jonah, but God didn't allow it. And this is Jonah's one last chance. If he didn't repent in the belly of that great fish, he would have stayed there, probably, right? But he repents, and God changes Jonah's situation. And we need to recognize that in those difficulties in our life, God's desire is repentance, us turning back to him. And if we don't, we're going to be in trouble. Jonah's three days and three nights in the belly of that great fish was also prophetic, pointing to how Jesus would be three days and three nights in the tomb after the cross. Did you know that? Matthew 12, uh, Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus would say this, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. It was prophetic, pointing to the fact that Jesus would come and take care of man's sin. And so we know this is something that really happened or Jesus wouldn't have referred to it in that way, right? It's not just some mythological story or fable. It's something that really happened, or Jesus wouldn't have mentioned it in that way. Was Jonah's grave a strange one? So was Christ, one which never man was before laid. Was Jonah there the best part of three days and three nights? So was Christ, but both in order to the rising again for the bringing of the doctrine of repentance to the Gentile world. Right? God brought Jonah out of the belly of that great fish after three days and three nights so that he could still go to Nineveh and bring those men, Gentiles, non-covenant people, right? Outsiders, unchurched people that didn't know anything about the Word of God, that probably didn't deserve to receive forgiveness. But God used the story of Jonah to show his mercy for the Gentiles. Same thing with Jesus. He died to not only save the Jews, but to save Gentiles. People who had nothing uh, to do with God, no idea of who God even was or what God's Word was all about. And God still has that same compassion today. Amen. He's reaching out to undeserving, lost people, and He wants to use us to reach out to them. Let's not let the apathy, rebellion, indifference, disobedience, and failure to submit that Jonah demonstrated characterize our lives in 2018. Amen. I don't want to be that way. I want to learn from Jonah's mistakes, God. That's why you included him in the Word of God. Not for me to repeat them, but to learn from them. And from the story of Jonah, we can see that God will often move heaven and earth to get us back on track. But it would be much better to deny self, wouldn't it? It would be much better to die to, st to self, to stay fully yielded, fully submitted to God at the foot of the cross each day, 
which enables the help of His Holy Spirit, than it would be to run from the presence of the Lord like Jonah did. God won't give up on us. He'll pursue you. But sometimes the ways He has to get us back on track is not pleasant. It's not comfortable for us. And if we'll just willingly submit and yield to Him, God will come and help us. Amen. And He'll give us uh, strength and ability that we don't have within ourselves. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close in prayer. If you're listening to this message and you've not given your heart to Jesus, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us, and He'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He went to the cross, Jesus did, to die and take away all the sin stains of your past. And He died to also break the power, the dominion, the grip that sin has over your life that controls you. Instead of sin being your master, Romans chapter 6, verse 14, Jesus can be your master. He can be your Lord tonight. And if you've not given your heart to Jesus, as we close in these, uh, this time of worship, I want to encourage you to give your heart to the Lord. Ask Him to come in and be the master, the Savior of your soul. And He'll come in and He'll forgive you and He'll help you to live a life that's so much better than anything the world has to offer. But for most of us tonight, I believe we're already, we've already made that decision. But have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? Have you allowed that overflow of God's presence to be in your life? If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you get saved and it's a free gift of God. It's by grace through faith that God saves you and He forgives you of your sins. And Holy Spirit baptism is also a free gift. We don't earn it. There's nothing we can do to make God give it to us. He makes it available as a free gift. All we have to do, just like salvation, is say, Jesus, I believe, and Jesus, I receive. You're the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I want everything that you have for me. Amen. Every weapon, every tool that you've made available, God, I want it in my life, and I want that overflow of your Holy Spirit. And so as we sing this song tonight, let your living water flow. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to lift your hands and worship Jesus. He's the baptizer. I'm not the baptizer. Nobody else, no preacher is the baptizer. Jesus is. And just say, Jesus, I believe. It's for me. And Jesus, I receive. If you've already been baptized in the Holy Spirit, begin to speak in that unknown tongue and worship Him tonight. Be refilled, amen, with His presence. You're going to need it this week. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. So I want us just to take a few moments and do that before we dismiss in prayer this evening. And let's worship the Lord. Let's give Him our hearts tonight.
pray for each other before we dismiss tonight. Let's stay filled up with the Holy Spirit, amen? Responding to the word of the Lord. Every time God speaks to us, He wants an answer. He wants a response. Let's learn from both the good and the bad in Jonah's life on how we should respond to God, amen? Let's not be rebellious or resistant against what God wants, but let's just say, God, I want simple faith, amen? I want simple obedience this week so that I can grow and be uh, more the person of God that you want me to be. Let's pray that for each other tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're teaching us in the book of Jonah. God, regarding the call of God, regarding the voice of the Lord, the word of the Lord, and our response to it. God, I pray that we'll mature in our faith as we look at the life example of Jonah and how you worked, how your amazing grace worked even through his disobedience. Lord, I'm thankful that you never give up on us. You're constantly reaching out to us, God, even when we're rebellious, even when we're running in the total opposite direction of where you want us to be. God, you're still pursuing us and loving us. God, help us to see tonight, God, it's so much better for us to stay fully yielded, fully submitted to you, denying self, dying to self at the foot of the cross. It's so much better to do that than to run from you. God, let us see that when we place our faith in Jesus and the cross, we're going to have a constant flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives, helping us to do what we could never do in our own strength. And Lord, that's to represent you well. Lord, we want to do that. Help us to be a witness for you this week. Help us to seize those divine appointments that you bring our way to share our faith with others, people who may be lost, people who may be like these sailors that Jonah was in the boat with, God, they're so pagan, they're so heathen, but Lord, you're going to give an opportunity for us to shine a light into their lives. Let us be ready, Lord, to shine that light. God, we just give you praise for what you're going to do. God, help us to put into practice what we talked about in this message tonight. Help us to be quick and ready to share your word with those that you bring across our path. Give us a good week this week. Help us to stay sensitive to your Holy Spirit, sensitive to the needs of others around us. And just use us as tools, as instruments in your hand for your glory. We'll give you the praise. We'll give you the honor for all that's accomplished. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.